That's good. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone uh, who's joining us from around the world. Lovely to have such an amazing crowd today. Great numbers. Uh, I'm Luda Pitti. I'm the head of a landscape for WSD in the UK. And uh, the topic of today's webinar is, stems from an idea that I had after meeting with architects about three years ago uh, when we were presenting and talking about future ready landscapes. And the idea first was what if buildings could breathe? And this idea morphed over time. And in the past 18 months, we've collaborated with ecologists and worked together to, to help formulate uh, this design paradigm, which uh, Matthew will talk you through for the next 20 minutes or so. And uh, over to you, Matthew. Thank you. Thanks, Ludo. So. So uh, my name is Matthew Jessup. Oh, my name is Matthew Jessup. Uh, I'm a tech and director for the landscape uh, and urban design team in the UK. Um, and we're here today to pose a question. Uh, what if our cities were more like forests? Um, the aim of today's session is to introduce this idea and provide some examples that will get you thinking uh, to stimulate debate and start a dialogue. Um, we don't have all the answers, uh, but we think this is a great idea, so we're putting it out there. Um, but before we get into that, just a little bit more about the, uh, the landscape and urban design team. So we are very passionate about what we do and the importance of our work at this critical time. And our intention is to be part of the solution. We believe in the power of collaboration and in order to achieve a future that enables all people and nature to thrive. We are a reasonably large team with offices across the UK and in India, and we work closely with those colleagues in India. So at the moment, we're about 80 people, roughly, um, but uh, recent acquisitions uh, mean we're going to be closer to 130. So it's a pretty large team. But we're a part of a global community. Um, so it's quite likely that there's a WSP landscape and urban design professional working diligently somewhere near you. But back to the theme of today, what if our cities were more like forests? Just turn my camera off. Okay. So imagine walking through an ancient broadleaf forest. Above your head, trees reach for the sun, harnessing solar energy, providing food and homes for forest communities. Beneath your feet, the ground teems with insects and in unseen fungal networks, absorbing water and breaking down forest debris. Everything is interconnected, nothing is wasted. We think of cities as the antithesis of nature, but what if our cities could mimic these natural structures and systems? Would they, what would they be like? Would they be better places to live? Natural systems that have evolved over millions of years can teach us a lot. We could learn to do more than just minimize harmful impacts, but also how to actively restore and revitalize our environment. After all, to be as good at designing as nature is a key principle of biophilia and regenerative design. Okay. Imagining the city as a Forest is a design paradigm, a tool that helps us to innovate and test new ideas. From the rooftop of individual buildings to the fabric of the buildings themselves, what happens at ground level and beyond into the surrounding neighborhoods and communities, the forest is an ideal model for moving beyond siloed and fragmented thinking. As a landscape architect, I'm not pretending to be an architect, a structural M&E or facade engineer, but we're seeing clear trends in the market where integrating natural systems within the built environment, blurring boundaries between professions, supporting multifunctionality and connectivity is becoming more prevalent. So can we supercharge nature-based solutions into nature-based system thinking for delivery at scale? Here is an example illustrating how we can. This is a study we undertook for a typical English town, exploring what an 
existing commuter corridor could be like if objectives based on sustainable travel, environmental and community benefits were prioritised in a coordinated way. By providing through journeys to the town centre by bus or cycle from an edge of town transport interchange, the local community recovers a significant amount of space. The road is no longer a barrier, but it becomes a street with a functional landscape peppered with opportunities to enhance biodiversity, manage surface water locally and improve air quality. The street is segmented so people can still access their homes by car if they need to, but not drive the full length of it. With less traffic, people can more confidently and safely walk and cycle locally, which improves their health, supports social activity, and the local economy. The backdrop to this study is urban growth that would nearly double the size of the town. So without adopting a different approach to travel, the town streets would grind to a halt. So what if our cities were more like forests? What would they be like? Here are a few more thoughts on the application of the idea, starting at the top with the forest canopy. This upper layer of the forest generates the most energy for the forest ecosystem. Solar panels on rooftops are a clear fit with this paradigm. But if we think of rooftops as the canopies of our cities, can we expect more of them? Should we expect more? Green roofs fulfill important functions such as supporting diverse flora and fauna and intercepting rainfall in the same way that the forest canopy does. But research indicates that when combined with a green roof, solar panels are on average 9% more efficient. So there are obvious benefits of having the two working in combination. It's important to be aware that not all green roofs are equal though. Designing plant communities with a focus on habitat creation is more valuable to nature, for example, than a, a generic sedum roof. So why aren't we doing more of this? One rooftop, can only do so much. The forest canopy is a collection of many trees that function as a continuous system. Roofsca roofscape in cities commonly covers 15 to 35% of a city's footprint and the enhanced surface area and connectivity provided by many green roofs would support greater and more diverse plant and animal communities and would make a really positive impact to city resilience. Planning policy mandating green roofs on new development continues to be brought into force across the globe. So this is a topic we need to be familiar with. So from a human perspective, accessible rooftops are a great opportunity for social activity. Accessible roof gardens benefit residents, employees and students who may have limited access to green space. A large percentage of buildings we'll be using in 2050 already exist today, and retrofitting is an important component of what we will be doing. The future roof study for the Stockholm municipality identified unutilized roof potential in the Stockholm region. The GIS-based Solkatan or SunMap helps to identify opportunities for economic, ecological and social benefits that create the greatest value for each building individually and for the municipality as a whole when applied at scale. There are practical benefits to incorporating living vegetation on buildings, which provide shade and improve air quality and energy efficiency. But what else? What if a building could breathe, for example? What about opportunities to use organic materials such as hemp for bioengineered and semi-permeable facades? To be successful, it's really important to understand this is more than just an aesthetic bolt-on. Images of greenwashed buildings are easy pro to produce but complex to deliver. Habitat conditions need to be understood to ensure plant selection will thrive under hostile conditions at height, where they may experience high winds, extreme temperature ranges and varied light levels. But plants need water too, and access for maintenance and replacement, which is equally important. These are key design challenges and successful delivery requires an integrated approach from an early stage. At the other end of the scale, architects like Neri Oxman are working at a cellular level, developing highly technological bioengineered or hybrid materials derived from natural compounds such as cellulose and pectin from plant cells and chitin, which is found in fungi, but more usually in insects and shellfish. 
These examples illustrate 3D printed components forming robust structures that will be biodegrade over time. The silk pavilion in the top right has been infilled with silk silkworms or by silkworms. So biodegrading matter gathers on the forest floor, feeding forest communities and enriching the soil. Soil filters water, regulates surface temperatures and stores 75% of the world's carbon on land. The healthier soil is, the more effective it is. And when we dig it up, we release carbon. Pavements and concrete require intensive resources to make, increase urban temperatures and water pollution. Because they're impermeable, they affect the health of microbial communities that sequester carbon underground. Grounding our cities in soil can counteract these effects. Increasing permeability with porous materials and sustainable drainage systems to retain water, reduce flooding and pollution, and improve the quality of our soil. This case study in London involves naturalizing a previously culverted stream to improve porosity, biodiversity and amenity, as well as providing sustainable flood protection. The new building cantilevers over the site and has the same footprint at ground level as the existing one. Planted roof terraces and a green roof effectively increase the vegetated footprint of the site as a whole. This pilot scheme for Westminster Council focused on reallocation of highway to improve conditions for cyclists and pedestrians and improve the quality of place supporting local businesses by increasing footfall, footfall and dwell time. The opportunity to address existing flood risk had been overlooked. So we were able to influence the thinking and make the plant beds functional rain gardens. This collaboration with ELF and Groening Architects for the city of Copenhagen has transformed a former industrial area. A variety of sustainable drainage techniques applied to integrate the flood, man flood management within the public realm, managing everyday and cloudburst events and making water management a visible part of this community's DNA. What's really interesting though, was that the city had set overall discharge rates for the development as a whole. So instead of each plot developing its own drainage strategy, developers and designers collaborated to ensure individual discharge rates for each of the 24 plots contributed to meeting the collective requirement for the development as a whole. Forests are complex and abundant, not monocentric like cities, but polycentric, a mosaic of different spatial types forming clusters like neighborhoods. When thinking of the forest of the city as a forest at scale, we need to think of the spaces between buildings as well, like the glades and clearings in a forest. The public realm is the place where we live, work and play. The significance of neighborhoods is on the rise. The 15 minute city idea championed by Carlos Morena at the Sorbonne is the idea that the six main activities of urban life, living, working, supplying, education, health and enjoyment are accessible by foot or by bike within 15 minutes. Apologize for my pronunciation, but Vajon is a great example of the application of this idea at a master planning scale. The vision is for a small scale, diverse urban environment promoting active life in a natural setting. Dependence on private cars is reduced through design and access control measures, walking and cycling networks, and high availability public transport. There's even a cable car. Blagrona, the blue green path, is a nature park that runs through the development. It's a continuous connection for water and nature, linking to four lakes and two nature reserves within walking distance of the development, which provide ecosystem services for the whole area. Malabaigard is a pilot study for the city of Copenhagen to test and demonstrate what additional benefits could be achieved when rainwater handling is integrated at the start of the planning and design process. In my opinion, two key aspects of the project's process led to its success. Thinking about additional benefits and the aspiration to discover what was possible from the beginning of the project and close multidisciplinary and stakeholder collaboration meant that there was time and technical knowledge in the round 
to explore multiple options and weave them into the fabric of the scheme, not bolt them on at the end. This resulted in a fully integrated design, which rather than adding cost, delivered cost and program savings, as well as multiple social and environmental benefits. It's interesting to note that as a result of an appreciation of the wider natural capital value of the additional benefits identified, it was agreed to reduce the density of the development through this process. Ecosystem services are another way of describing the additional benefits derived from natural assets and can be used to quantify and value those benefits. Culture is an ecosystem service that is important for health and well-being, exemplified by what we call the sense of place. Forest typologies are unique and specific to place, conditioned by physical and contextual influences. Being sensitive to the genius loci or the unique qualities that make every place special should be one of our main objectives. Globalization of Western, primarily Western culture, has led to a loss of cultural connections with the land and nature as place. For many indigenous peoples, land is animate, not inert, and stewardship of the land for generations to follow is central to that relationship. We also need to recognize the movement of people across the globe, whether through displacement or migration. Validating multicultural presence within communities, which can be focused into geographical into geographically distinct um, neighborhoods is really important. And we also need to acknowledge the demographic composition of society, cultural background, socioeconomic status, age and gender, gender influence our perception of public spaces and how we use them. So as culture, culture and values evolve over time. So as we celebrate diversity, equity and coexistence in society, so our buildings and public spaces must project those same values. Shouldn't we actively seek cultural reference points to celebrate that diversity and differentiation in the built environment? We can do this not only through place naming, but also by exploring form, spatial arrangement, materials and decoration. The Te Papa project in Christchurch, New Zealand was developed following the earthquakes of 2010 and 11. Collaboration with local communities enabled Maori cultural values and cultural narratives to be richly expressed and celebrated in the scheme. The new Riverside Trail includes 13 welcome mat artworks associated with Maori meeting houses. But the cultural interface went deeper than surface decoration. Mahinga Kai, which refers to the importance of managing natural resources, the natural resources that sustain life, and Te Mana o Te Wai, which expresses the vital importance of water to life and the need to treat it with respect, are two examples of Maori principles that inform design decision making on this project. Te Mana o Te Wai was enshrined in New Zealand water policy in 2014, but updated in 2020, where the health of water was put first human needs second, and other needs such as industry last. Te Aranga Māori design principles have been developed by Māori design principles, professionals, sorry, and adopted by Auckland Council in recent years. This illustrates how traditional cultural values that may have been more finely attuned to the natural environment in the past have something to teach us. It also points to the importance of ensuring policy and legislation is kept up to date in order to support change and reflect how we perceive and value natural resources. So this has just been a snapshot of some ideas which I hope shows the richness of the what if way of thinking. We're conscious this isn't all new, but considering these ideas within the narrative of the city as forest could give some insight into tweaks or subtle adjustments that could be made on existing projects or identifying new opportunities. But if we take a step back, Let's understand some of the important drivers sitting behind this idea. Why are we talking about cities and nature in the first place? Cities are huge consumers with high energy demands responsible for over 60% greenhouse gas emissions and 50% of global waste. While cities only account for 2% of the world's surface area, over half the global population live in urban areas. Research shows that spending time in nature contributes to health and well-being in healthy communities. We spend 90% of our time indoors, 
Loneliness and isolation are becoming more prevalent and many people do not have access to green space, particularly in lower socioeconomic groups. Is the way we are designing cities fit for purpose then? One of the lessons of COVID and the climate change and biodiversity emergency is that we need to reconnect with nature both personally and societally. And this underpins the social importance of ensuring nature is provided at scale in the public realm. We're used to thinking of cities as the antithesis of a natural environment, and we've taken nature for granted for generations. This needs to change. A World Economic Forum study has found that 50% of global GDP, that's $44 trillion, is moderately or highly dependent on nature. So global economies are embedded in nature. Rather than just being an aesthetic design feature, nature-based solutions are essential to creating a more sustainable and equitable urban environment. Buildings and new development have a key role to play in delivering biodiversity. Nature-based places and providing opportunities for people at all levels of society to engage directly with nature. So we're talking about both nature and society equally important and supporting each other. The United Nations vision, leave no one behind, is expressed in its sustainable development goals, which clearly de demonstrate how the natural environment, social equity, economic growth, decarbonisation and behavioural change are all linked. Recalibrating our relationship with nature is a step in the right direction, but investment is needed in order to make change happen. On the back of COP26 in Glasgow, the announcement of the new task force on nature-related financial disclosures signals a step in the right direction. Many policymakers and businesses are considering how we can shift investment towards nature-positive outcomes, but uncertainty and perception of risk about successful outcomes is holding back progress. Pilot studies, monitoring and data collection are essential to support uptake of innovative technologies at scale to offset concerns of failure and also uncertainty around cost commitments, such as maintenance. Monitoring health and economic impacts to establish a baseline and determine performance against defined criteria is at the heart of projects such as the EU funded research program, Horizon 2020 Liverpool Greenup. In partnership with Liverpool City Council, Mersey Forest and the University of Liverpool, we develop proposals for renaturing through innovative nature-based solutions. The project focused on a green corridor in the north of the city with green walls and a floating salt marsh habitat at Wapping Dock. Tarsinja Platch is one of more than 300 cloudburst projects in Copenhagen designed to manage predicted increases in extreme rainfall events. This first climate adapted square to handle stormwater was a catalyst to stimulate urban regeneration. As well as monitoring and making the water cycle visible, increasing education and, and awareness of climate change issues was a key objective. So placing nature at the heart of planning decisions could be the solution for more sustainable and equitable urban development. There are three things I'd like you to remember. Timing, think about what added benefits to nature and communities you can deliver at the beginning of the project. Collaborate, multidisciplinary working and engaging with communities is at the heart of really successful outcomes. And data, collecting baseline data and ongoing monitoring is vital to build a database that will attract investment so we can make this happen at scale. This has been a brief introduction, but hopefully it explains why we think this is important and gives a flavour of what can be done and the power of this idea to support innovative thinking. We've identified six principles for planning great places for life, but we want to go further. I hope this is the start of a dialogue and if you have any ideas or examples that you'd like to share, do get in touch. Thank you. Now we'll take some questions. Thank you, Matthew, for a fantastic presentation and apologies for those who experienced some issues with the audio today. Um, so just some housekeeping items. Uh, the presentation is available to download in the handout box as a PDF. And also uh, there is a question box where you can ask questions for the Q&A session. So we received some fantastic questions during the um, registration and I will start with those. 
um, how might we weave ecology into the heart of clean growth and place-centered regeneration? So <clears throat> this is really about uh, collaboration. So the point I was making before about you know working in multidisciplinary teams, um, you know it's really important that we that we have ecologists in those teams, and we think of this as a as a um, sort of natural capital opportunity. Ludo, did you want any, add anything to that? Yeah, I think I think the uh, the key to that is is being able to think spatially and connect the dots between the master planning, the landscape architecture, and the uh, natural capital thinking, and joining the dots for that multidisciplinary solution. So it's very much getting that dialogue and multitude of perspectives. And, and ensuring this multitude of data sets that are being brought together that aren't always looked in correlated ways that can actually help open up new solutions to common problems. Thank you. There is a comment here. Uh, it says, not a question, but Southampton have added the green roof on top of uh, bus stops shelters. Great to see bees using them. <laughs> uh, so great use of very small space. I have a related question for this as well. Uh, how can we ensure that the uh, green infrastructure sites are effectively integrated with biodiverse and pollinator friendly plant species? Uh, so I, th I think that that's similar to the, the previous question really. It, it's really about designing for nature and, and being specific and um, rather than using generic um, you know plants or or, or, or sedum or the, the, those kind of things you know they have their place but um, we, we really need to be focused on, on on bringing ecology and a deep kind of technical understanding of nature into our into our thinking. Thank you. Um, what is your input input on living walls, urban greening? What does the future look like? Um, well, I hope this is a question we received before the presentation. I, I hope the uh, we, we, we've answered some of those questions. Um, if if you want to talk about this more, then more, more than happy to do it outside outside this call. Thank you. Yep. Next question is, uh, sorry, Ludo, did you want to mention yep. anything? Yeah, I was, I was just going to say on the, the future of urban greening, I think there's, there's a lot of exciting potential on the horizon. We've got a number of projects with clients where we're looking at new ways to fund and unlock uh, new ways of looking at urban greening at both large and small scale, large and small scale. So I think, uh, Going back to what Matthew said, it's, it's, it's looking beyond collaboration, but also unlocking those benefits that can actually bring new investments forward. And uh, I think that that comes from the broader connectivity between disciplines, decision makers and investors, because actually there's a lot of multiple benefits to nature and we can do so much more. Thank you. Next question is, uh, can we have green spaces without blue spaces or do they both go hand in hand? I think uh, personally trying to do them separately is is where we've been going wrong. And if you've seen from some of the examples we pointed to and uh, if in doubt, speak to any of our colleagues in Denmark and they can show you how effective that can be. So I, I, I think that in future, you know, we, we've historically or in recent years been talking about green infrastructure, but, but really we, we, we need to be talking about green blue infrastructure because the two things are go hand in glove. 100% and that's, that's why the, uh, the chapter we've written in the new Manual for Streets is entitled Green Blue Infrastructure. And one of the key uh, recommendations in the new Manual for Street is every street should have green blue infrastructure rather than every street should have trees so we're, we're definitely on on the ball with regard to that combination we need to look at them together uh, there's a climate and ecology crisis and we need to address that through that coordinated approach thank you 
how can we weave this approach with indigenous cultures and uh, relationship and value to nature? Um, well, again, I, I, th I think, you know, we, we've, we've sort of given some indications about, you know, how, how this relates to the topic. Um, but uh, I'm more than happy to, to discuss this further because obviously um, indigenous people, you know, we, I, I talked about the Maoris in, in New Zealand, but, but clearly we've got indigenous cultures across the globe. So um, how can we empower those cultures and bring them into the dialogue, bring them into the conversation um, is, is, is a really important question. So, so you know, I, I think we, we're, we're only beginning to start that journey, but uh, it's a really exciting one. It could be a webinar of itself, I would say. Mm, there's an idea. <laughs> <laughs> For 2023, I guess, yeah. Watch the space. Um, yeah. <laughs> watch the space. Uh, I will take the last question. What is the most future-proof uh, between biophilic design addressing human needs and green corridors introducing animal presence? Um, I think uh, if, if, if it's a sort of question about some priorities, I, I, I don't think we can, you know, it, it, it's about striking a balance um, between the natural world and, and our and, and, and sort of natural, the needs of nature and the needs of, of, of human beings. You know, we, we've, we've sort of set ourselves aside and apart from nature for, for too many years and that, that's what's got us into the situation where we're in now. So, so I think, again, um, the one can't go without the other. Yeah, and in a way, the, the city is almost the, uh, a new type of ecosystems in itself, you know, if you're in the edge of Anthropocene. And I think if we start to look at the city as another as a new ecosystem, then it, it unlocks new pathways with regards to how species can and do co coexist very well with humans in cities and actually celebrating that more and, and opening up more of that going forward, because actually it will benefit us both. Yeah. Thank you so much, Matthew and Ludo, for a fantastic presentation and such an interesting and very relevant topic. Uh, so thank you, everyone, for joining today. Thank you for your time. Please feel free to follow up uh, with the presenters via the contact details shown on the screen. And I wish everyone a very good day. Thank you so thank much. Yeah, look forward to speaking.